Hi, welcome back to 101 Things. This time I want to give you an update on the latest changes that have been made to the breadboard radio. But first, let's look at some of your builds. First, let's look at the noise reduction feature. The receiver is already doing a lot of the filtering in the frequency domain. This means we can add noise reduction without too much effort. In the frequency domain, the signals split into lots of narrow bands. We can process each of these individually to remove noise. The processing for each frequency channel is like an automatic squelch control. If the signal falls below a noise threshold, we don't pass it on. If it's above the noise threshold, we pass it on unmodified. Unlike a squelch control, which uses a hard threshold and either switches the signal on or off, we use a soft threshold. We vary the gain gradually from zero, when the frequency channel contains mostly noise, to one, when the frequency channel contains mostly signal. This plot shows the gain curve for different signal to noise ratios. To make this work, we need to come up with an estimate of the signal and the noise. To estimate the signal, we use a rolling average of the power over a short period. To estimate the noise, we use the minimum power over a much longer period. To save memory, we're using a leaky minimum hold algorithm. In this simulation, you can see the noise level, the signal level, and the gain at each frequency. First with the algorithm disabled. Signal broken at 2000 feet. Temperature 11.8. And then with the noise reduction turned on. It's a very simple algorithm, but it does a very good job of removing noise. Because we're doing frequency domain processing anyway, we don't need a huge amount of extra memory or CPU to make this algorithm work. Okay, let's see how it works for real. This example is a very noisy shortwave station. And this example is a noisy Volmet weather update. I've also revamped the TFT display. It's hard to tell, but I've actually completely rewritten the drivers for the TFT display. I've optimised the code and made much better use of DMA to improve the refresh rate of the waterfall. I've also added a retro style frequency dial and S meter. You can now change the zoom and the smoothing on the waterfall and the spectrum display. Uh, using the British way in Zimbabwe for some time. So what they did at the time when the chainsaw country kind of uh, also made it difficult for us to kind of eat. They colonized the country for some time. They took the land, they took so many stuff. Another neat contribution is the tone control. It allows you to boost the bass or the treble tones through the menu. It uses a very efficient bi-quad filter which gives very good results but uses hardly any extra CPU.
I've also made it possible to change the IF frequency through the menu. I added this mainly for debug, but I found it can be very useful for mitigating unwanted interference. I've often found that you can completely remove spurs or harmonics just by changing the IF frequency slightly. Changing the IF frequency has the effect of moving the spurs or harmonics, but the signal stays in the same place. So a slight tweak to the frequency can move the spurs and harmonics out of the passband. One of the cool features of the Pi Pico RX is that it uses the PIO function of the Pi Pico to generate the local oscillator. It means we can build the receiver using minimal hardware. But there's nothing stopping us using an external oscillator with the Pi Pico RX. And I thought it would be fun to add support for the SI5351 just to see how it works. Keep in mind that this is an experimental optional feature. You don't really need the external oscillator to get the Pi Pico RX up and running. For most people it's much simpler to just use the internal oscillator. The Taylor detector needs two oscillators 90 degrees apart. It's possible to generate both of these signals using the SI5351. Hans Sommer from QRP Labs was the first to come up with this technique. He uses the delay feature in one of the channels of the clock generator to give a 90 degree phase shift. This technique works really well, but it's limited to a minimum frequency of 4 MHz. But we'd like the receiver to work on the long wave, medium wave and lower short wave bands too. There's another technique from TJ Labs that allows low frequencies to be generated directly with the SI5351. This technique sets up two frequency channels at very slightly different frequencies. Over time, the two channels drift in phase. If we wait until they've drifted by exactly 90 degrees, and then set the two channels back to exactly the same frequency, the two channels stay 90 degrees out of phase forever. You need to time things quite precisely, but this technique actually works really well for generating low frequencies with the SI5351. I generated a very simple library for the receiver, which generates low frequencies using the TJ Labs method, and high frequencies using the Hans Summers method. You can switch between the internal and external oscillator in the menu. Aliasing has always been a bit of a weakness of the Pi Pico RX. The ADC has a bandwidth of 250 kHz, but the ADC doesn't include any built-in anti-alias filters. Instead we rely on the filtering in the TALO detector. The TALO detector has a relatively slow roll-off, so we do sometimes get alias signals leaking through. If you ever hear signals that are a few hundred kHz away from where they should be, such as a CW signal in the single sideband part of a band, you're probably listening to an alias. Fortunately, we can get a massive improvement in performance by adding a simple low pass filter between the Taylor detector and the ADC. This mod just needs two resistors and two capacitors. This makes the circuit slightly more complicated, but I think the improvements in performance make it worth it. The receiver already included a frequency calibration facility. I've made some improvements to make this easier to use. You can calibrate the receiver by tuning into a medium wave or long wave station with a known frequency. If the frequency on the dial exactly matches the frequency of the station, the carrier should have a zero hertz offset. I've added a measurement facility that measures the frequency of the carrier, and I've used this to add a handy indicator for adjusting the frequency calibration. I'm using Radio 4 on 198 long wave. This has a known frequency, and it has a guaranteed accuracy. The left and right arrows tell you whether to increase or decrease the frequency calibration setting. You have to adjust this slowly to allow the measurement to stabilise. A well calibrated receiver should have a frequency offset of 1Hz or less. I found that the oscillators in the Pi Pico tend to be very good. The Pi Pico RX already includes USB audio connectivity. It can appear as a USB microphone for recording or for use with digital mode software. The receiver now includes the ability to send raw IQ data down a stereo USB audio channel. This raw IQ data can be used with SDR software such as QuISC or GQRX. You can switch between standard audio or raw IQ streaming in the menu. Another project I've been working on is the SSTV decoder. If you haven't seen the SSTV decoder, you can check it out in one of my other videos. The SSTV decoder is standalone and can work with any receiver. But the code for the SSTV decoder is quite lightweight, 
I thought it would be fun to integrate the SSTV decoder into the Pi Pico RX. The SSTV decoder works with the TFT display. You can switch between the standard view with the waterfall and spectrum scope and the SSTV decoder using this menu item. In future updates, I'd like to include other digital modes in the receiver. Well, I hope you enjoyed this tour of the latest features. If you've enjoyed this project and you'd like to see more, why not subscribe? I've got loads of ideas for new projects that I'd like to share. Okay, that wraps things up. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time.